everyone. Art for racists today. Yes, really. Buckle up. And no, I am not going to define racism for you. I know I'm pedantic, but I'm not that bad. Racism is bad? Yes, it is. And it is for many reasons, but for our purposes today, it's bad because it tells a story that's not true. Through art. And though I'm sure racists have made and commissioned lots of art, for our purposes today, we're talking about public monuments. There have been quite a few high-profile clashes in the last few years over public monuments, and it seems that people from the left and right of the ideological spectrum have strong feelings about these statues, what they mean, and where they belong. But I haven't heard many art historians on the subject, so I thought I'd chime in. And I hope these thoughts can help racists, sure, but also I hope they help everyone to understand that the stories we tell ourselves don't necessarily have to be true to be impactful. So let's start way back in that simpler time of 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, with a furore over a pretty mediocre statue of Robert E. Lee. By the way, I'm Nancy Langham Hooper, PhD, art historian, and cultural enthusiast, ready to use the great art of the world to help you out. If you think this is even a little bit cool, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and ding the little notification bell. I post every Friday and YouTube will tell you all about it. So anyway, so the artwork in question today, uh, this statue of Robert E. Lee, was at the center of a Unite the Right rally, which took place in August of 2017. White supremacists, neo-Nazis, and all sorts of flotsam and jetsam descended on Charlottesville to protest the proposed removal of the statue. They carried tiki torches, they spouted anti-Semitic slogans, and they brought lots of Confederate flags with them. The organizer, Richard Spencer, vowed to, quote, defend these symbols of our history and our people. And it all turned violent and they killed a counter-protester. <sighs> Most of the time, when we talk about public monuments, we talk about their history or the person that they're depicting. But us art historians sometimes like to look at the object first. So let's do that. Let's look at the statue. Commissioned in 1917, the original artist, Henry Schrady, died in 1922 with the statue unfinished. And the project was taken over by sculptor Leo Lentelli, who finally completed it in 1924. We see a man on a horse, dressed in a military uniform. The horse is depicted mid-step of a slow walk, its head bowed, tail swishing behind. The rider sits bone straight, head held high, with eyes lowered to the ground. He loosely holds the reins with one hand and grasps his hat with the other. His sword is sheathed safely onto his saddle, and his face has a sad and resigned expression. Underneath horse and rider, engraved on the plinth, is a simple inscription, Robert Edward Lee, 1807 to 1870. Artistically, it's an okayish statue, bronze, which is nice for its greening patina, and the expression comes through on the face, though the lines are pretty rough. Anatomically, the horse is done better than the rider, who comes off as a bit squat and stiff. Maybe that is Schrady versus Lentelli's work. It's hard having two people work on a sculpture. The main thing I notice here, though, is how unlike most equestrian statues this is. When military men were depicted on horseback, it was usually in the heat of battle or celebrating a huge victory. Their swords are drawn, the horses gallop or rear up on their hind legs, and everything is pretty epic. At the very least, it's calmly victorious. But here, you have a slow walk and a despondent rider. Why? Because this guy lost the war. Most of my viewers in the United States will know of Robert E. Lee, but for everyone else, he was the commander of the Confederate Army. Briefly, during the American Civil War in the 1860s, the Southern, or Confederate, states broke away from the rest of the Union, and a bloody battle ensued until they surrendered and gave up the idea. Kind of. So what was the Civil War about? It's pretty simple, really. Slavery. The Southern states depended on slave labor as their economic model, and calls for its abolition seriously threatened their economy and their comfortable white supremacy. And look, 
the Northerners were racist too. They just thought owning and buying and trading human beings was a step too far. Did they get a cookie for that? I don't know. So in 1861, the South seceded from the North and the war began. It lasted four bloody years and the South was pretty much thrashed. They surrendered, humiliated. They had to give up their slaves. They ruined their whole lives and much of their land in order to keep people as property, hardly something they wanted to acknowledge in all its sinister and shameful reality. So no sooner had the war ended than a movement in the South began to retell this humiliating story. A myth called the Lost Cause sprung up around the causes of the war and the reasons for the Confederate defeat. It wasn't slavery we were fighting for. No, it was states' rights. The Northerners were being imperialistic and oppressing us and stuff, but not about slavery. No, because slavery, which, you know, wasn't so bad, really, was slowly dying by 1861, and it would have just gone away all by itself. The Lost Cause myth helped Southerners regain their dignity after the war and helped them to reject the new emancipated status of Blacks in their community. Within a few decades of the war, Jim Crow laws became the new normal, which separated white and black amenities, prevented blacks from voting or holding office, and encouraged the violent lynching of black people. Jim Crow would keep a stranglehold on the South all the way into the mid-20th century and the civil rights movement, though, honestly, it exists in other forms even today. So the lost cause was an attractive fiction. How do you make that fiction seem real? That's right. Monuments! After all, the 18th to the 20th centuries were the golden age of, hey, let's put up a statue of this great white man in our town square to show how awesome we are. Though I acknowledge that the Romans were also really into this. In fact, most Confederate monuments were put up between 1900 and 1930, the years when the Lost Cause myth was at its height and Jim Crow was being used to solidify white supremacy in a new way. And Robert E. Lee was a favorite subject. In fact, there are statues of Lee scattered all around the South, and even some in northern states. He's carved into a mountain in Georgia. He's got high schools, highways, and even an army base named for him in his native Virginia. So, the Charlottesville Monument was pretty typical of this time, and a typical depiction of Lee, the humbled yet dignified Southern gentleman who fought for a worthy cause. Even the Northerners had sympathy with him. I guess because everyone is fooled by charming Southern manners, right, Mr. Underwood? This version of Lee is also a complete fiction. Besides being slightly incompetent in battle, he was also a brutally cruel slave owner. Oh, and he also led a rebellion against the United States. Should that count for something? Why on earth is an army base named after him? Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. But back to the statue. When we examine these public works of art, there are two main things to consider, narrative and placement. First, narrative. What story is the work of art representing? Here, it's pretty obviously the lost cause. So this isn't a historically accurate depiction of Lee showing a moment in his life, for example, but a caricature meant to convey the honor and the pathos of the lost cause. Okay, that's fine. Some people ages ago wanted to make a racist statue, so why do we care now? And there we have to look at the second consideration, placement. Because the statue wasn't made for some dude's private collection, it was made for the public square. A public square originally called Lee Park, and then later it was called Emancipation Park, but that probably didn't go over too well either, so now it's called Market Street Park, which is very literal. When we put images into our civic landscape, we are saying that we accept and identify with the narrative those images convey. They become a part of us, a part of our civic identity. Remember when we talked about Michelangelo's David, how Florence felt they were the underdog to Rome, so had David's anxious eyes point toward their rival city, stone in hand? David wasn't just a great story to them, he was part of their own identity. And for better or worse, Robert E. Lee went from a man who lost a war to a heroic symbol of the genteel South because that's what white Southerners thought of themselves. It's how they justified their losing the war and their continued oppression of black people. And it's still up there, right now, a hundred years later. 
still nobly riding off into the sunset. Lee's statue isn't controversial because people want to change history. It's controversial because people know what actually really happened and can see the gap between the reality and the depiction of the man. They can also see the gap between what they value as a community and the white supremacy that underpins the myth of the lost cause. But they've been tricky to take down or move. After the Unite the Right rally and the violence that followed, the city tried to do a halfway resolution at one point by putting a black cover over it, but a judge ordered them to take it off. Now, defenders of the statues claim that they represent veterans of the war or history or Southern heritage, but this is a disingenuous fiction. It's simply an attempt to control the narrative, which is what the lost cause was in the first place. And when others say that the statues must come down, they're pushing back against that narrative. They're not just replacing one myth with another. And there is narrative in the statue. It's pretty obvious. Look at that horse's bowed head. Look at Lee's sad but noble face. The sheathed sword, the head held high. This isn't history or heritage. It's the lost cause and it needs to go. As an art historian, I have no problem saying that Confederate statues and monuments should be removed from the public square. And I would include any other art around the world that maintains a narrative of white supremacy or colonialism. Let's not be that racist anymore. Let's try to be better. And I probably should add here, just for clarity, that not all public statues are racist. Hashtag not all statues. And since placement matters, I think these things could be on display, but just in a different context. A museum of white supremacy, perhaps? We shouldn't hide these works of art away, but we don't have to celebrate them, and they don't have to be part of our identity. So, what can we learn from this? I mean, assuming we're not on a committee to decide the fate of Confederate monuments, or considering joining a neo-Nazi movement? Let's remember that narratives are powerful things. They don't have to be real to shape our reality. In our own lives, there may be myths that we have to break down. Was grandma really a saint or a controlling woman? Does the shrine to dad's military service hung up on the wall prevent you from thinking about the years of abuse he put the family through? Was your mother really loving or was she sometimes loving and sometimes neglectful? Family myths can tend to canonize people, but there are instances where someone is demonized too. Did Uncle Frank really heartlessly run out on your dad's business? Or were there other circumstances? This isn't just about the Confederacy. We must become historians of our own lives, constantly sifting through the primary source material and questioning the narratives that we live with, especially the ones that hold us back or have a toxic underlayer. Questioning the myths in our lives doesn't mean that we're erasing history. It simply means that when those myths are put into context, our lives become more open, more loving, and more honest. Well, I hope that's helped you dissect the myths and narratives of your life and our larger civic life. As usual, I've included some links in the description box below on the lost cause and the Confederacy. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. I've just reached 100 subscribers and I'm gonna have a Q&A special coming out very soon. Okay, deep breath. You got this. I'll see you next time.